Since solar energy is a land use that inherently takes up a lot of acres, I want to be sure that it's being developed as responsibly as possible. My name is Christopher Toy. I am a PhD candidate in the Department of Soil and Crop Sciences at Colorado State University. What I'm studying at JAX is this idea of ecosystem services. Ecosystem services are benefits that humans get from ecosystems that aren't normally given a monetary value, like carbon sequestration, or providing habitat for pollinators, or improving water quality. It's clear from previous work, restoring degraded sites with native vegetation enhances ecosystem services. But as more and more solar arrays are installed in healthy agricultural land, we're not necessarily starting from that point of degradation. We're starting from a point of relative health. And so our question is, is it worth it to go in, create this disturbance to give the native species a chance to establish? Or is that not really giving much benefit for the amount of effort that you're putting into it? The way this study was designed, there are three different treatments. The existing pasture, both with and without irrigation. And then one native mix is balanced between grasses and wildflowers and one native species mix is primarily just wildflowers. And again, that's irrigated and unirrigated. We hypothesized that by planting these native wildflowers specifically, we could improve the quality of the habitat for pollinator species. What we did is once a week, we would visually count and record the number and species of flowers in each plot and at all four of the transects within each plot. What we found for the pollinator habitat is that the plots we seeded with native species outperform the existing non-native pasture vegetation. Specifically, the treatment that had the most wildflower seeds planted showed a statistical difference in diversity and abundance, and it also showed a consistently greater quantity of blooms over the season. Diversity is important because bees and butterflies, they have food preferences just like we do. If you were presented with a buffet that had two items, uh, maybe you're kind of picky. Maybe you're not that into it. But if there's 10 items, 20 items, well, there's probably something for you. Same with the bees and the butterflies and other pollinators. The wildflower heavy native treatment had a consistently higher number of blooms each month of the year. So it wasn't just there's a ton of alfalfa, for example, and you get all your blooms, a ton of them, but all at once in July. It had the flowers spread out over the whole year, which makes it a better resource because it's more consistent for the pollinators. Another interesting finding is that the plots that we irrigated actually developed less wildflowers than the plots that we did not irrigate. And what I think is happening is the irrigation actually provided more of an advantage to the non-native plants that we tried to knock back, the smooth brome, the orchard grass, than it did to the wildflower seedlings. And this might be because they're already more drought adapted than the pasture grasses. This is really a positive for land managers who are hoping to reintroduce native species into this type of setting, because it means that all of the trouble and expense of irrigation may well not really be worth it. For carbon sequestration, we're always interested in two things, how much carbon is coming out of the soil and how much carbon is going into it. In order to sequester more carbon, in order to sink it into the soil and keep it there, we have to be continuously putting more in than we are losing. Most of the carbon that is entering the soil and has even the possibility of being sequestered is from plant roots. And what we found is there is not a significant difference in the amount of root production between the non-native and the native vegetation and between the irrigated or unirrigated plots. 
So for both root production and CO2 being released from the soil, these are primarily influenced not by what type of vegetation or irrigation is present, but rather the microclimates, the transects within each treatment. For productivity of biomass, the amount of forage that is being produced, the non-native pasture treatment excelled in this category. It outcompeted the native vegetation treatments. And this is perhaps not surprising, given that these pasture grasses, the smooth brome, the orchard grass, were specifically bred for productivity of biomass. This is something that you could either graze animals on and get value from it that way, or alternatively, it could be cut and harvested as hay. So another important measurement that we took is soil compaction. This is relevant because compacted soil makes it more difficult for plants to grow roots. It essentially constrains their growth. So we want to keep the soil kind of aerated and light so that plants can grow easily. There's the possibility of the soil being compacted during the installation due to heavy machinery. And there's also the possibility when we went in and tilled the soil to plant the natives, that that could have destroyed some of the soil structure. What we see is more soil compaction in the open and on the edges than there is directly underneath the solar panels because of the way that the machinery moved in between the rows of solar panels, not directly underneath. However, the magnitude of this difference is not something that's really gonna be of real practical significance. In terms of tilling that was required disturbance to plant the native seeds, we did not see any lasting impact on soil compaction. And so this is really a good sign. It means that if you want to establish native species and you're gonna go in there and till in order to do it, as long as you till under the right conditions when the soil is friable and you're not tilling continuously, over and over again, there's no real reason to expect that you're gonna be doing substantial lasting damage to the soil. So should you leave the non-native pasture in place or should you seed native species in a system like Jack's Solar Garden? There's trade-offs. It's going to depend on which ecosystem services a land manager wants to prioritize. In the case of soil compaction or carbon sequestration, it's kind of a wash. We're not seeing a substantial benefit or detriment to either. But in the case of forage production, the non-native pasture does better than the native plants. And in the case of providing habitat for pollinators, the native plants do better than the non-native pasture. So the question as a land manager is, do you want to prioritize forage production for things like grazing animals or cutting for hay? Or do you want to prioritize habitat for pollinators to either provide benefits to nearby agricultural operations or possibly even support beehives as a product in their own right? The reason I care about working in the sort of agrivoltaic space is really related to questions of land use and how efficiently we use our land as a society. So much of species extinction is driven by loss of habitat. Jack's Solar Garden really represents an excellent prototype of really what is possible in these systems. There are so many different potential land uses being trialed having all of these different options and having rigorous data around them will really empower land managers, solar developers, people working in these fields to make the most suitable choice for their specific situation.